Hi there, everyone. Today I have a really special guest, Dr. David Hamilton, who is a good friend of mine. I have been a friend and a fan of his since 2012. Isn't that right, David? That, that's right. Yeah. And I've been a friend and a fan of yours, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's mutual. A and, big fan. <laughs> um, and yeah. I have always loved your work. I loved your appearance in Heal. It was um, yeah, it was superb. Everything that you were saying, oh, you. it was absolutely superb. And um, so David and I met each other at an I Can Do It event in Scotland, didn't we? In yeah. 2012, yeah. when Wayne Dyer first started, first introduced me. Um, and yeah. for any of you who don't know who David is, Dr. David Hamilton, check him out. He's an author with Hay House UK. Um, he's, he's um, check out the uh, the movie Heal, the documentary Heal, which has uh, so many great speakers like, of course, Dr. David Hamilton, Greg Braden, Joe Dispenza, Bruce Lipton, myself, and lots of people on there. So um, David and I, um, I actually contacted David and said, hey, let's have a conversation about some fun things. Because um, David and I both, of course, believe in the afterlife and spirits and ghosts and things like that. And I wanted to kick this off by actually telling the audience that I had an incredible dinner last night with the woman by the name of Julie Reiger um, here in Los Angeles. And um, she's recently become a, a friend of mine. Lovely, lovely woman. I just adore her. She, so she's someone who just wrote a book called The Ghost Photographer because mm -hmm. she is able to see images in smoke. So she uses white sage to do smudging and allows the smoke to form and she watches the smoke and she takes photos and she sees deceased um, loved ones who have passed on in the smoke and she takes photos of them and she looks at the mm. photos and she actually sees images that are, the likeness is too uncanny for it to be a coincidence and it happens mm. too often for it to be a coincidence. But I know from having been on the other side that our deceased loved ones actually can manipulate things like technology and smoke and things like that. That's how they communicate with us. And, mm. uh, and just for the audience, I want to say, as I was telling David this, David was telling me he saw an image of his deceased dog recently, didn't you? Yeah, it was it actually it was a couple of years ago. It was just after Oscar died. Uh, my my dog Oscar, he was he was my best friend. Now, we don't have any human babies yet, so Oscar was our, our boy, and had an amazingly strong bond with him. And uh, and he, he passed away when he was two years old. In fact, Anita, you I don't know if you know this exactly, but Oscar arrived in my life two days before we first met, oh. and it was. And it was the beginning of me deciding to start working on self-love and self-esteem. And and then, obviously, we met at the I Can Do It conference, and I was just blown away with your your story. And we had, obviously, we spent, what, at least a couple of hours, you and I and Danny, just chatting that night. And then, wind the clock forward, and I'd finally finished the book. And Oscar passed away two days before I finished it. So he arrived in my life two days before I started and he passed away two days before I finished. Like he, he was there in my life for that perfect duration until my project, i.e. me growing enough in my, my self-love, my self-esteem had reached the point. Uh, and, and what got me through that difficult time in my life, because it was such a difficult time, because he really was incredibly close. It was, my, it was my family. And the only thing that got me through was believing that that was why he came into my life. And then it was a few months later, and I was still kind of mourning, and there was a lunar eclipse. And I pulled over at the side of the road and to take a video of, 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 the, of the eclipse. Uh, and sorry, it wasn't a, it was a, so, it was, yeah, it was a, a solar eclipse, uh, and it was a partial. And I took a video of it, and about like 22 seconds long. And it wasn't until a few months, uh, sorry, a few hours later when I watched the video back and I just gasped and there as clear as anything was Oscar's face with a big stick in his mouth with his eye was the was the, the sun and the moon overlapping and it was so incredibly obvious and I just burst out and burst into tears and it was this overwhelming feeling like, wow, it just, 
it, it was just showing me I'm still here, Dad. And and that that kind of thing, you know, for me that gave an that added to the meaning of the whole thing for me. And I know other scientists can be skeptical of this kind of thing, but you know, science is a very broad subject and not everyone agrees. And you know, but for me that that gave absolute meaning to part of the whole situation for me. I love that because, and I think one of the things I love about you is that you come from a background of science and yet you're so open to all this because many years ago when I first had the near-death experience, um, the scientists that I dealt with, the medical doctors that I dealt with, they were trying to dismiss, they could not dismiss what happened to me, but I found that the, their approach to anything they can't explain is to try and poke holes in it as opposed to, hey, let's accept this, let's encompass this, let's work with this. It's more like, okay, what is wrong with this picture? How can we mm. poke holes in, in it? How can we dismiss it? That's how they approach anything that's outside of the materialistic view of the world. And so, yeah. and this is one of the reasons that I was um, so, you know, so interested in, in talking to you because you were so open to it. We, I remember we talked about things, we went in every direction from talking about how time is not linear in, in, on the other side. And I know that that was Oscar's way of, of communicating with you and telling you that he's okay. Yeah. See, see what you mentioned, time not linear. Can I, I share with you a little example of a profound and moving experience I had in the final seconds as Oscar slipped away? Yeah. So it, it, I've never, pub never publicly shared this. And I but, just want to say that we have a lot of viewers who actually ask me whether they whether I think their pets are okay on the other side. So I think wow. this will be very assuring for them. So go for it. Yeah. So in Oscar's final moments, Elizabeth and I were w there with him and he was he was slipping away and we always had this little thing we said when it was time to go I feel myself get quite emotional uh, when it was time for him to go to sleep uh, and he understood that if he was going to be left alone for a little while, we would always say sleepy time. And he knew that that meant, OK, I'll go to my bed for a little bit. And in his final moments, and I was worried in those final moments that if he slips away, he's only ever had myself and Elizabeth. And what's he going to do? His mummy and daddy aren't there. And it was his final moments he was slipping away. And Elizabeth and I both recognised it. And we said, sleepy time. It's sleepy time. And then he closed his eyes. And he just drifted away. And then I had this profound, moving experience of being there with him at the other side. Like time was compressed on the other side. And the moment of his passing was exactly the same moment as my passing for him. Because yeah. time is the same on the other side. So it was like a loop. So when he passed away, that moment is exactly the same moment from his perspective as when I passed away. So when he passed away, I was there with him. And it was an incredibly moving, it, it just, I just widened right up and I felt relief. I can't explain to you the relief I felt. Like I was there with him at the other side at the moment when I passed because it's the same time for him. Wow. So he wasn't without, he wasn't without his mummy and his daddy. Do you know, I actually, I know exactly what you're saying. I really yeah, do. I felt it. I felt it in that moment. You felt as though you crossed over with him. Yeah, and I was there at the moment when I passed in, you know, X amount of so many years into the future. But I was, the, but because time for him is the is compressed, all time is one on the other side. Then so he, then I was there with him. He'd already moved into the future where you have already joined him. Yeah, and yeah. it was the same time for him. So there was never a moment on the other side where he was without his mummy and his daddy. And that, that so gave me that gave me peace at that moment because I wasn't worried about him because he, he he used to follow me around all the time. I mean, anywhere I went, he just followed me. He was in my shadow, uh, and I was so scared of him, me not being there for him on the other side. But yet, he I was there for him on the other side. You see, and and I know people who have lost loved ones. You know, whether it's pets or humans. You know, family members, where they have been there with their loved one as, as their loved one crossed over and they felt their own 
crossing over with them. They felt their loved one crossing. Mm. They felt as though they crossed over with the loved one. Yeah. So you experienced exactly that with Oscar. Um, yeah. I have had so many people tell me that, that when they have been sitting there holding the hand of their loved one who's about to take their last breath, it felt like they've crossed over with them. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I totally, I totally get that. I totally, totally get that. See, that is so beautiful. Mm. And you know, shortly after, after Wayne Dyer died, his family, they went to Maui to um, have his memorial and also they cremated him there. They threw his ashes into the sea. Mm. And one of his daughters, Serena, took a photograph off the ocean. And when she looked at the photo, Wayne's face was in that photograph. Wow. And it was so clear because she posted it on Facebook. And anybody that looked at it, even when I, I looked at it, and I was like, oh, my God, it's unmistakable. It is his mm. face. It was there. Yeah. Like, and once you saw it, you couldn't not see it. It was yeah. just so clear. And that's how they communicate with us. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I never cease to be amazed, actually. I, I think, you know, I think we're learning all the time. And I know some, you know, scientists can be dismissive of this, but, but you know, as scientists, we're trained to be skeptical. Yeah. And, and for good reason, because because what you eventually do is you can narrow in on, a, on a, a more profound understanding of things. But I think some things what we have to do at a point is say, okay, in order to expand our knowledge, I need to embrace perhaps what if this is true? What if, so as scientists, we should, we, many scientists do ask these questions. What if this is true? What would that mean? Yeah. And then that takes you into a whole new arena of, of, of asking new questions and understanding. And I think sometimes when you broaden the questions that you ask, then we're taken into this, you know, because, you know, although it's easy to dismiss some of this kind of stuff, but, it, you know, science hasn't proven that consciousness is produced by the brain. We can we can say we can look at brain scans and you can identify what the brain is doing while someone's having a conscious experience, but that can't tell you what the experience feels like. So there's this thing called the hard problem where where science is kind of stuck there. So I think we have to ask these questions. What if this is true? That consciousness isn't in your head, but that which you are is out there, is everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's slowly changing and getting better, but I'm thinking back to shortly after I had the near-death experience. Um, my doctor who was treating me, my oncologist, he knew what had happened to me couldn't happen. He knew there was no explanation for it. He told me that. He even said, I don't even know what to write in your medical records. But when he was asked publicly, he didn't admit that. He actually yeah. said, oh, yeah, it was some of the things I did. I removed the fluid from her lungs at the right time. And, you know, he had to yeah. give it a reason. Of course, Publicly, he of could course. Not, he could not say that, uh, that, yeah, I can't explain it. It shouldn't have happened. Yeah. And so it's really interesting. And so one, one day what happened is that um, I met, uh, so I, this was in Hong Kong. And this is, I'm going back 10, 11 years um, when, I found it a lot harder to share back then than I do today. So I was at this dinner party where this uh, friend of mine, she knew what had happened to me. And she had invited this man who had flown, who was there from Europe, who was an academic researcher, scientist, and he belonged to some big science research society in Europe. And so she told him what happened to me. And he was fascinated. He was interested. He was very open. Um, and he, he uh, asked me questions about my story. And I told him everything. And then he said to me, I would love to fly you to Europe. And, and I, I won't give all the details of where it is because, you know, I don't want to throw them under the bus or anything. But uh, he said, I would love to fly you and have you come and speak to my academic society to the people there because oh. I would love for them to hear your story because I'm trying to open their minds that there is something more. Uh, they are so embedded, so focused in material science that nothing exists be beyond our five senses, this materialistic world. So um, he said, I want to fly you to Europe. We'll put you up in the hotel and we'll pay for everything and you just come and speak. So this was in 2007. 
And I was really excited. I was like, yeah, of course I'd fly to Europe and, um, mm. you know, all expense paid trip. And so they treated me really well. They flew me to Europe. They put me up in a really nice hotel, beautiful old building. Um, I, and they even gave me a, a, a suite and it the building looked like a castle, very beautiful. Um, so then on the evening when I had to go and address these academics, and I shared my story. Most people who, um, you know, who follow me on Facebook, you know my story. I shared it. I shared about what happened on the other side and how I met my dad and how it wasn't my time and how time was not linear. And then when I came back and how I literally healed so fast, the doctors couldn't explain it. In four weeks, the tumors shrunk by 70% and so on. I shared the whole thing. And all these academics, they were like listening to me. And then when I was done, um, they, you know, I had to open myself up to answer their questions. And here's what I noticed. Their reaction, very different from the reaction I get when I speak to like a Hay House audience or something. When I, today, when I speak to the kinds of audiences I speak to, they're all like, wow, that's incredible. They come and they'll give me a hug and they'll want to know about their deceased loved ones on the other side, or they'll want to know how to heal their illnesses. But over there, the way that these people think, they have a completely different way of processing information. Everything that was going through their mind was, okay, how do we dismiss what happened to her? How do we explain it away? It does not fit in our paradigm. So how do we poke holes in it? So one of the questions that came to me was, could it be possible that you were misdiagnosed? So I said, okay, if, if that anything is possible, but if I was misdiagnosed, it would have had, I would have had to have been misdiagnosed by at least six or eight different doctors and specialists over a period of four years um, after having a multitude of tests, you know? So it's like mm. literally, it, for them, they would even try and look for that needle in the haystack. Yeah, um, yeah. And then when I would answer questions, when they would ask me, where was the cancer? Where did it spread? And I would tell them everything. It was lymphoma. It spread. It metastasized in the lymphatic system. And I'd be answering. And then one of them would jump in and say, are you a doctor? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm just a regular person who had something happen to me. And then he would say, but you know an awful lot of medical terms for someone who's not a doctor. Like he was very suspicious. And I said, that's because I had to deal with cancer for four years. I had to understand what was happening in my body. I've been dealing mm. with doctors and medical mm. people for four years. So you pick up the terms. But it was, um, it was an eye opener for me. And that's yeah. when I actually decided to stop sharing my story until mm. Wayne Dyer discovered it. But so, so the reason for my saying this is that we live in a world where it's very hard to have experiences that are outside of the five sensory, you know, paradigm yeah. that we believe in. And, and the onus seems to be on us. But I share today and my reason for bringing you on and speaking to people and spreading the word is because I want to flip that. I want mm. people to be fearless about sharing their experiences. We don't have to fit into that box where we dismiss mm. anything that's outside of material science. It's, the onus should not be on us to prove it. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. kind of where I am. It's almost like, you know, um, I think of it in terms of, okay, it's time for revenge of us six sensory beings, the revenge of the six sensory beings, yeah, I love or the that. revenge yeah. of the six sensory experiences. Yeah. It's time yeah, for us see, to come out of the closet. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I ask, see, just for the benefit, I, I know that people who, in my Facebook community will be watching this, uh, and many of them might not be to fully familiar with what actually happened. Would you be able to just briefly uh, share what it was like when you had the near-death experience and what happened afterwards in terms of the, the disappearance of the, of the tumours? Yes, sure. So um, I had end-stage cancer and um, I had tumours, some of them the size of golf balls or lemons, from the base of my skull, uh, the base of my skull around my neck and I still have the scars under my arms and um, in my chest and all the way down to my abdomen. 
I had I was dealing with this cancer for four years and of course it started with just a little lump in my neck on this side and uh, and and it progressed over a period of four years it went into remission and then came back and and uh, and it progressed with a vengeance and I reached the point in 2006 where um, I weighed about 86 pounds 85 pounds my muscles had completely <clears throat> deteriorated because my body was no longer absorbing nutrition. I breathed with the aid of oxygen, piped oxygen. I wasn't absorbing nutrition and so my uh, nutrition came in the form of a food tube. Uh, my lungs were filled with fluid. I couldn't lie flat or I'd choke on my own fluid. I was so weak and in so much pain and so much discomfort and I looked like a skeleton and I couldn't walk because I didn't even have the strength in my legs to hold my own weight up. Um, and I was in so much discomfort that on February the 2nd, 2006, I went into a coma and my organs shut down. And the doctors said that this was it. I wasn't coming out of the coma, that I was dying. These were my final hours. They said I wasn't even gonna make it through the night. Um, but unbeknownst to everyone, I actually felt incredible. I had actually come out of my body. I could see my physical body lying on the hospital bed and it looked so small and weak and in insignificant. But I was free from my body and I felt powerful and mm -hmm. alive and more alive than I had ever been in life. And I felt incredible like really, really like um, fearless, like all the discomfort was gone. The fear was gone because I had feared cancer. I had fear of the treatment of cancer and I feared death. And now all of that fear was gone. And, um, and I describe that feeling as a feeling of love. Just, it was as if I was in a sea of unconditional love like just pure uncondition unconditional wow. love. And I realized that that feeling of love is the absence of fear. It's as though fear and love can't exist simultaneously. And when all that fear is just gone, it feels like you're just like in this sea of love. Um, mm. I was able to see and hear and feel everything that was happening in the hospital room around me. I heard the conversations taking place between the doctors and my family members. Um, I then continued to move on and it felt as though I was expanding and, and going into different, into different higher and higher states. And then I encountered my dad who had passed away 11 years prior to that. And um, my dad wanted me to know that it wasn't my time to die and he, he said, that um, I should turn back, but no part of me wanted to come back. It felt that I wasn't being forced to come back, but I was being advised strongly to come back, that, that I hadn't completed my purpose yet, and that my purpose was linked with Danny's. And here's a funny thing about time. So they had taken all these tests on my physical body. Um, they had they'd taken all these tests uh, of my organs, my kidneys, my liver, because my organs were now shutting down. And, and um, they had already told my family that she's now going into organ failure. Look, the toxins are building up. My physical body was swelling up and I had every symptom of organ failure and they knew that's what it was happening. But they took these tests and while I was on the other side, I actually knew that if I chose to come back into my body, that when they get the test results, the test results would show that my organs were still functioning, that it was okay, that my org basically that my organs hadn't completely shut down. But if I chose to stay on the other side in death, wow. the test results would come back showing that I had died of organ failure due to end stage cancer, that the organs were failed. Mm. So in other words, my decision of whether to come back or not determined the outcome of the tests, even though the tests had already been taken. And wow. yeah, and so this, and I myself, I'm not a quantum physicist. I don't understand how time actually works. 
But I do know it's not linear. I know it's not linear and I know that it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me and I know that because I knew that if I came back that my body would heal very, very quickly. And everything, so after I came back, the tumor shrunk by 70%. Um, and then within five weeks, uh, within three weeks, they could find no trace of cancer at all. After five weeks, they let me go home because I gained enough strength in my legs and muscles. And that was 12 wow. and a half years ago. 12 and a half years ago, I've been living wow. cancer free. And, uh, but the, the, the main thing is that the fear of cancer, the fear of death, all of that has gone. Mm. Um, my dad said to me on the other side, it's not your time. Go back and live your life fearlessly. Wow, that's yes. incredible. Yeah. And those words have, have stayed with me. And I know what he means by living fearlessly. It means go back and be yourself fearlessly. Because mm. my biggest fear was, um, was displeasing other people, disappointing mm. people and not being good enough. And I was a people pleaser and a doormat because I feared criticism. I feared shame. I feared disappointing people. And that's what yeah. controlled my life. And I feared cancer. And I feared mm. death. And I feared the retributions of the afterlife. I feared everything. Mm. And look at you now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, wow. and I understand now. And I know a lot of people will relate to this. A lot of people relate to this. I understand now that I was born as someone like you, David, and like many people out there who are tuning in as a sixth sensory being. I was born as someone who was an empath, who knew there was more to this world and this life than our five senses. But when you are forced to shut down that sixth sense and you're forced to squeeze into living a five sensory life, you lose your way and that's where the fear comes in. It's almost like you being forced to live your life with your eyes closed. Imagine if um, people tell you that your sense of vision is fake, it's not real, it's your imagination. So keep mm. your eyes closed. You would live a very fearful life if you had to navigate the world yeah. by shutting down one of your senses. This is what we do without realizing it. We mm. shut down our sixth sense and navigate this world from a place of fear because we've been conditioned to believe that that's our imagination. That's what I realized when I was on the other side. And so I said, wow. no more. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to pander to the, to the critics and the skeptics and the materialists. I'm not going to pander to them because I know it's real. Yeah, and wow. That's what I and, revenge and, and, sixth sense people. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, lo I love that, that you're so passionate. You've got such a conviction and, and really not concerned with whether people believe you or not. No. And, that, and, and that's about, that's like saying, I love myself just as I am. Yes, exactly. And that's just what it means to love yourself. It's not yeah. necessarily about looking in the mirror and affirmations and things like that, although that's great. Louise actually um, broke the mold by, you know, she, she created a springboard for us to mm -hmm. love ourselves and all. I love Louise Hay. But to me, really loving yourself means being okay with who you are, even if it's completely different from everybody else. And honoring yeah. who you are and saying, this is me. I don't need to suppress this or conform. Or if, mm. you, if people think I'm a quack or a woo-woo or an idiot, or delusional, that's fine. I love my life, you know, and, yeah. and half the people who think I'm a quack or woo-woo or delusional, they're not happy with where they are. I'd rather be me than them. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, for, for me, you know, in term, for me, loving myself is not being afraid uh, as, a, as a scientist to discuss these topics and say, look, I believe this because I've had some felt experiences and I, I look at the world in a much more philosophical way than perhaps a mainstream scientist, but that's who I am. And I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to shut that down just so that other, you know, bigger known scientists might agree with me and say, well, well, well done, you're part of our, our team. I don't really care whether I'm on a team. You know, this is who I am. This is what I, this is how I look at the world. And this is what I'm going to continue to investigate about life and consciousness. And, you, you know, my, my self journey began when I, I met you, because what most people don't know 
is just before when when you when you and Wayne Dyer left the stage, and and I was next on the stage at this I Can Do It conference back in, in 2012. I had a panic attack at the side of the stage. Oh my god. It, I was terrified. It wasn't like I was nervous about speak, nervous about giving a talk. It was I was comparing myself to to Wayne and to you and to you know Cheryl was there and, and Robert was there and, and many of the other really big speakers that all of whom I I was in awe of because I'd read all your books and I felt like who am I to go on after after these people and as daft as it might sound I got a flashback to when I was a child at school and the teacher, I hadn't brought money in for a school trip because my mum and dad were very poor at the time and and the teacher wanted us to bring in like, it it was, you know, five pence, which is maybe 10 cents in America uh, to go on a school trip. And I hadn't brought my money in because I knew my mum and dad were struggling and I didn't know the value of money. And the teacher reprimanded me because I was the only kid that didn't bring the money in. And she gave everyone, everyone queued up at the front of the class, got a, a yellow badge uh, and, and well done for bringing your money. And she said, David Hamilton can stand in the corner and he's not coming in the school trip Aww. and because he didn't bring his money in. And what my six-year-old brain processed that day was everyone in the class is special except for me. And so I went the next, you know, near almost 40 years with that belief ingrained in my mind. So I I got bullied at school a lot. And it wasn't for the normal reasons people get bullied. It was because I was showing off all the time. But the reason I was showing off is because I felt deep down that I needed to give people reasons to like me. Otherwise, they wouldn't. I had to, to show that I was special because in my in my childhood brain, which most people still run as an adult, eh, everyone is special except for me. And that memory profoundly came into my mind while I was having this anxiety attack at the side of the stage, because to my six-year-old brain, everyone in you and Wayne and Cheryl and Robert and all those had the yellow badge that the teacher gave that says I'm special. And I profoundly felt that I had nothing to offer. And that's why I had the anxiety attack. And eventually I had to go on stage because there's a thousand people waiting to hear me giving a talk. So it was extraordinary for me when you and I chatted that night and you were talking all about your experience on the other side. And it was all and so much of it was about self-love and being yourself. And I knew never before has it been so clear to me what subject I had to immerse myself in next, which was was self-love, with learning to love myself just as I am and learning to accept myself just as I am and not be afraid to be myself. And I remember the very next day I I contacted Hay House and I said, this is my next book. I don't care if you publish it, I'm doing it anyway. And I remember the MD of Hay House in the UK, Michelle, saying, oh, David, you've you've never spoke to us like this before. I said, I don't care. I'm, I'm so passionate. This is what I have to do for me. I have to do this now. Uh, and that was that all happened on on that day when you and I first met, and it was all about me learning that I had to learn how how to love myself. And and what I I mean by loving yourself is to learn to have an inner sense of worthiness and value that's not dependent upon anyone liking you. It's not dependent upon a particular set of circumstances or, or, or achievements. You love yourself, an inner sense of worthiness and value, just as I am. Yes, I love that. And that was the beginning of my journey. I had no idea it started that day that we met. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm so touched by that. I'm so... Yeah, and Oscar had had arrived just two days earlier. Yeah, so it all kind of... That's why I was so drawn to you that night. I, I couldn't leave you and Danny alone because I just felt that we're we, we're supposed to be part of the, a journey now, and, and I need to be in your space. And I, I, that's why I followed you around. And Danny, <laughs> the whole night. I thought you were wonderful. We 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 loved you. We were like, oh my gosh, we just love this guy. He's so nice. He, yeah. You 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 are and was so lovely. You're just such a good human being. And so oh, you know, and, you. and for me, it was like. Yeah, you epitomize sensitivity, empathy. You just, yeah, you're just an all-around great guy. <laughs> oh shucks! <laughs> you know, in my new self-loving uh, feeling, I, I'll, t- I'll take that. 
I'll take that one. <laughs> so, yes. And I was bullied as a child too, which is what made me a people pleaser. It made me believe that I wasn't good enough and I always had to um, I always had to bend myself out of shape like a pretzel to fit in and to make people like me. So yeah, I've been through all that. And it was, you know, and after I had the near death experience, I, the, the clarity was incredible that we don't need to do that. Everybody's doing that. Even the bullies who bullied you and me don't love themselves. That's why they do what they do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a chain reaction. We're all doing it. Yeah, and it just and it keeps going until someone stops. Yeah. yeah, and interestingly, when I was growing up, um, I used to be scared of my dad. My dad used to bring me up with fear. So when mm. I met him on the other side and he said, go back and live your life fearlessly, he wanted to break the chain mm. because he knew that he grew up with fear. He was a fearful person. Mm -hmm. But he projected that fear onto me. So he brought mm -hmm. me up with fear. So I became fearful and, and we'd gone full circle. So that's what he meant. It's like, I don't, you know, it was almost like, so I felt I would be judged by my dad on the other side or judged for being a bad daughter. On the mm. contrary, what happened, it was almost like my dad was apologizing to me for bringing me wow. up with so much fear. And it was like, it's time for you to break that cycle and go and live wow. your life fearlessly. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and you have done ever since. <laughs> I think yeah. I have. And it's really funny because I'm writing my third book and I feel it coming out all over this third book because I've kind of, I'm writing this book for me and for the people. It's like, um, I have a publisher, my publisher is a Simon & Schuster, and they are probably a little bit more, um, uh, how would you say, more, a little more academic than say Hay House is, and they have certain rules, but uh, I don't know what's happened. I've kind of said, but this is my book, this is what I'm writing, this is what I have to say, and I'm writing it the way I need to write it. I'm letting it rip. I'm talking about being a sixth sensory being. I'm talking about how to, um, how to grow into that, how to live in that in this world. And I'm like, you know, you guys have to deal with it. You've signed me on and this is what my audience wants. And I know this is what they want. This is what I've been put on this planet to talk about. Mm. If I'm going to talk about what everyone else is going to talk about, then, you know, why do you need me? Yeah, yeah. So I've Amazing. kind of had this and I'm surprising myself because I've never been like that before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 the next it's the next level. <laughs> That's yes. what it is. Sometimes yeah. I feel guided by Wayne, and um, there was a lady who who um, was speaking to me the other day, and she was a, she's a channel, and I was actually asking her. I said, okay, so can you see anyone around me? Is someone guiding me? And she said, yes, Wayne, Wayne still comes and checks on you every now and again, but he's so proud of you, and he's telling you that you can tell people. Uh, he's saying he wants to give you permission um, and he's saying he what he really loves and he wants to give you permission to do more of it is to feel that you do have the authority to tell people it's no longer about them telling you this is what you need to do. It's about you mm -hmm. saying, no, this is what I need to do and either you're on board or you're not. So basically, yeah. and what he was referring to is not about being a troublemaker or anything, but more about this is my truth. This is what I came back to share. So don't yeah. silence me. It was it was that. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> you're really you're really living your truth now, Anita. It's beautiful to watch, and it's highly inspiring as well because. It just every time I listen to you speaking, even though I've I've heard your story, it still moves me as if it's the first time I've heard it. But whenever I I talk to you, I always feel like I can do anything. Like I just have to be myself. I don't have to be afraid of anything. I can just literally do anything. And you have that kind of infectious if effect because you're so completely present when you say that, and you absolutely mean what you're saying, and you can feel it's palpable. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, um, thank you. I, 
that's it's you know it's so beautiful to hear that thank you oh and look and we've got some wonderful comments oh. from the listeners um maitri bora thank you two best real people i love you both much keep inspiring wow oh, thank, thank you. you and we've been so i've been loving this conversation so much that it's almost like um, we've just been talking to each other that I have forgotten we have an audience. And I know, I know. Let's, let's go to our listeners and our viewers mm. and let's take some questions and comments. And please feel free to ask us anything, anything at all. So um, just post them. And Danny, who's behind the scenes, is going to pluck them up. And bear with him because sometimes it's very hard for him to find the comments because they kind of go by really, really fast, don't they? Mm, um, yeah. So anything, so when he can find something and get his hands on it, because the technology as well, it's a bit slippery. So he needs to kind of home in on something and then punch it up on the screen. Um, Mana Esk Maria Eskin. Hi, Maria Eskin. Two of my favorite people in the world. Thank you. Oh, that's lovely, Maria. Thank you. Um, and uh, and also, I would highly suggest to anyone viewing to watch the movie Heal. Laurie DC, with that wonderful Scottish accent, Dr. <laughs> Hamilton need not ever worry about speaking on stage. I would listen to him speak about cleaning dryer vents, pill bugs, anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laurie. That made me smile. <laughs> I love your accent. I just love it. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I do the best to, to speak with a Scottish accent. I'm really American, but I just, I just put the Scottish accent on because someone said they like the sound of it. No, I'm only kidding. I, I am genuinely Scottish. I live in a town called Dunblane in central Scotland. It's famous for, uh, latterly famous for Andy Murray and Jamie Murray, the, the tennis players. So they live, well, they grew up in Dunblane. So... So that's my accent is kind of central Scotland-ish. And you yeah. play tennis as well, don't you? I play tennis as well, yeah. Not particularly very good, but I play tennis all the same. Yeah, I play about three or four times a week. It's my exercise, you see. And you have to play tennis if you live in Dunblane. <laughs> it's kind of expected of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking about our deceased loved ones and what, I've, uh, what I believe is that they can manipulate certain things like clouds and smoke and water and images of water and and they can also manipulate technology like very often i feel wayne comes to mess around with my technology um he was there in full force on his death anniversary um just under a month ago it was the 30th of august and and everything that could go wrong on that day was going wrong. And I knew it was Wayne because, you know, why that day? Um, and because I know that they can mess around with technology. So um, I'm just saying this because I want to assure people that this is the way that they communicate with you and let you know that they're OK. Um, a very good friend of mine, she this was several quite a few years ago she lost her son and uh, which was devastating for her her adult son and her son lived in a different country from her and she would communicate with him by skype regularly and every night when she would go to sleep she would leave her computer on and her skype window open because just in case her son would call her but anyway he wow. passed away and what happened is on the morning of his birthday her computer, the Skype ringtone started ringing and she shot out of bed. She looks over at her desk at her computer and it showed Alex is calling and there was his photo as if he was calling her and it was his birthday. So wow. she runs to the computer and she clicked on it and it wasn't Alex. It was her own sister calling from Canada, yet another country. Yeah. But somehow it had uh, Alex's yeah wow and and that doesn't happen where you just yeah. have a crossed line so to speak it yeah. actually was alex's picture saying <laughs> alex calling wow that's and amazing so yeah. you know and i really believe that was alex telling her i'm okay on his own yeah. birthday so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I totally get that i totally get that yeah and, and if anyone else has had experiences like that please share them because even if we don't catch 
your comments now on this thread. Um, I will definitely, and I know David will as well, we'll go back and read these comments and so will other people. And we will be sharing this video. And if you know anybody who you think will be helped, anybody who's lost a loved one, who's lost a pet, please share this video with them. And, uh, you know, and please share your own experiences in the comments. Mm. And Maria Strandling, if time is linear, <sighs> Yeah, actually, time is not linear. Could you come back to another time age, like at the 15th century, 1500th century? I think you could. What do you think, David? It, I, I would say you're doing it right now. I, I would say that what you are, say your, your, your pure consciousness, which some people might refer to as your higher self. So let's say your, your being, your pure con consciousness, I believe dips into an experience of physical reality uh, simultaneously in lots of different ways at the same time. Now to our mechanical uh, brains, our biological organisms, we would perceive some of those times as the past and others as the future. But your higher self is simultaneously in the 15th century, the 29th century, a uh, parallel multiple realities parallel to us forwards, backwards in time, but doing all of it at the same time. It's a bit like, you know that game, I don't know if you have it in, in the United States, we have a game called Twister, where you have different colours and someone spins, different coloured circles and someone spins a little dial and you've got to put your foot on the blue circle and your hand on the green one and your nose on the red one. Well, on, in Twister, you can have your foot or your nose or your hands in like five, four or five different circles at the same time. Now, I think your consciousness, that which you are, your higher being, simultaneously steps on all coloured circles at the same time. In other words, many different times at the same time. But you can only ever experience yourself on one circle at one time. So while we have this experience today, is this is, is the year 2018, so your biological experience of reality that you're having right now as this identity is experiencing one reality, but your higher self, that which you are, is simultaneously on all of the circles at the same time, because there is no time on the other side, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. And that's, that's why when Oscar crossed over, he saw the future you that had already crossed over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because there really is no time on the other side. Because when I was on the other side, I saw different lifetimes that I had lived. And I could tell that some of them were historic, like past lives, and some of them were future. I could see my future in this lifetime um, panning yeah. out. And it has panned out, you know, pretty much the way I saw it. And I could see all of that. But the clarity with which I could see it was as though it was happening then and there in front of me. Like I, yeah. I wouldn't, as I was viewing it, I couldn't say, oh, that's already happened, that's yet to happen. But if you assign dates to it in comparison to this date, yes, some of those were past lives and some of them were future in yeah. relation to the to this date of 2018. Yeah. See, the, the, most, the most current uh, advanced theories of quantum gravity. I'm, I'm saying quantum gravity. Don't be put off any any listeners by quantum gravity. Basically, in science, we we've always had this problem of of uniting quantum physics with with gravity, with Einstein's research. And there's always been this these two polarities. You have the quantum scale of the really small, and you, then you have the cosmological scale of the really big which is Einstein's arena, relativity or gravity. And the most advanced theories of quantum gravity, when you fuse them together and you're looking for how things work at the quantum scale, there is no time variable. It literally doesn't exist. When you go down to the quantum scale, there is no variable. There's nothing in the equations with T for time. It just simply does not exist. With the most current theories of quantum gravity, there is no time. Oh. When you get to that level, in some of the, the really clever experiments based on a gentleman, a professor of physics called uh, John Archibald Wheeler, who has been the, the, the tutor of more Nobel Prize winners than any other professor, uh, as far as I, I, I understand. And he uh, figured out, he proposed 
is something called a delayed choice experiment. And he said, if we could develop the technology, which we now have developed and we now have done and proved him correct, he said that if we we fire at some subatomic particles in one direction, they will either go through door A or B, eh, as long as we're looking at it. But if we set the experiment up, that we don't know until after the particles have gone through A or B, that we don't know until afterwards, we can decide afterwards what we want to do, then it will alter the past and it will de- our choice today will determine what happened in the past, whether this beam of particles went through A or B. And it was called delayed choice and it was only a few years ago where scientists, we developed the technology to be able to test that and we did it and proved that, yeah, a choice in the present seems to affect what happened in the past, providing you didn't know what happened in the past. That's a bit like the test they took for the organs when I was in the coma. Yeah. Where they where yeah, the, yeah. The, the the results depended on whether I chose to come back into my body or not. So yeah, they'd yeah. taken the tests and I I'm in a coma, they take the tests, and if I choose to come back into my body, the test results come back after I come out of the coma, and the yeah. test results come back and say oh, your organs are functioning. They're not completely dead. They're going to, you know, you're going to be all right. Mm. If I choose to die, those test results come back showing organ failure. And what goes in my medical report is death due to organ failure as a result of end-stage cancer. Yeah. And, and with, these, with these quantum mechanics experiments, it, one of the explanations for it is that both of these possibilities actually happen and they're both valid, they're called histories and both histories exist. But the one that we experience is the one that's consistent with the choice we've made today. So both histories exist, but the one that you'll, you'll remember and experience will be the one that's consistent with the choice you've made right now. Yes, so the, so the reality of me having crossed over, having died also exists. Yeah, 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 and all of them exist at the same time, yeah. but you will only experience one of them, and it'll be the one that's consistent with the choices you're making right now. Yes, and I sometimes liken it to, if you think of an uh, apartment building with, let's say, 12 stories, all 12 stories exist, but you can only experience one of them at a time, yeah. but they all exist simultaneously. Yeah. So all 12 stories exist simultaneously, but when you're in one of the stories, in one of the apartments, um, it doesn't mean that the others don't exist. And you are traveling through them linearly, like, oh, in the past I was on the sixth floor, in the future I might go to the eighth floor, right now I'm on the seventh floor. But all those apartments exist simultaneously, whether you're yeah. in them or not. That's kind of your higher yeah. self. Yeah. yeah, and it's there at, all at the same time. All at the yeah. same time, yeah. From it, from your higher self's perspective. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that I find that so interesting. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, here's a question from Sophie Christelle Vos Villar: Are we four-dimensional living in a 3D world? I would say yes to that, definitely. Me, I would also too. say we are six or more sensory beings. Um, definitely a minimum of six sensory or more l- trying to squeeze into a world that only caters for five senses. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally. would say. And this is why we're so messed up, if you will, and why uh, we feel so much fear and why we have it so wrong when it comes to treating illnesses and body ailments because we're not taking into consideration this whole other realm beyond the physical body where illnesses and discomforts actually start. We're not even mm. looking at that when, when, when we have doctors and people immersed in medicine, when they're dealing with our illness, they think they're dealing with the illness, but they're not. They're dealing with it after it's manifested as a physical symptom on the body, but the illness starts elsewhere. It starts in that sixth sensory le- level. So any more good questions? Sarah Easton. So a choice in the present could heal past traumas? Amazing. Yes, they could. Any comments on that, David? As far as as that science goes, there was other kind of 
psychology based, well, kind of, kind of ESP based types of experiments. I should written up, and Dean Radin's got a new book called Real Magic, and in that book he talks about some of these backwards time kind of experiments. That, and I believe that choices we make in the present do affect the past because the past, present and future are happening but it's just we don't have an experience of all we have is a memory of the past and an anticipation of the future but all of them are, are happening right now so as far as I understand things any choices we're making in the present must be affecting the past and the future it might not look that way it might not appear that way but on some levels, they must be because all times are connected. So there must be a connection in some way. I, I, I'm not, you know, a, a therapist in the sense that I have very little experience of working in, in that kind of way of trying to heal a past trauma. But I believe that, that the past, present and future are absolutely, absolutely connected. And therefore, to me, it makes sense that that would be possible. Yeah. Oh. I totally believe it as well, 100%. I mean, and the number of people that um, have said to me things like um, they've gone to doctors, let's say, for tests and things like that. I mean, this is somewhat related to what we're saying. They've gone for tests and, and the doctors have been so sure about something. The test results show that there's something going on and they're scheduled for um, surgery or whatever. And in that time between the, them getting that test result that tells them that whatever, they've got cancer or whatever, they get enough of a traumatic wake up to make some kind of shift that mm. by the time they go in for the surgery, whatever it is is gone. I've had a lot of people write to me yeah. to share this. So it's almost like they have healed something in, um, it's literally quantum it's almost like they've even had to heal because you, for something to manifest as cancer it had to have happened a long time ago in the past if we think of time in linear time mm. so they have healed it in like a condensed period of time very quickly it's almost like they've had to go back into the past to heal what caused it yeah, and even from even from a mainstream science perspective, science can't rule out that that kind of thing possibly happens quite a lot. Yeah, as as one of the explanations for things, but that we don't, but we don't interpret it. Science maybe doesn't interpret it in that particular way, but perhaps that type of thing's happening all the time, and I it's just it's not interpreted in that way. Yeah, because I see things happen like that a lot, like all the time. And so I always tell people, um, always, you know, take take time to, to heal yourself. There's no rush. If a doctor says you need surgery right away, actually it's whatever it is has been going on in your body for a long time for it to manifest. It doesn't matter if you wait another week or two or, you know, unless it's uh, an emergency, an accident, but I'm talking about illnesses like cancers and things like that. Um, and also, in fact, um, yeah, I was about to say something else and I, 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 I lost it to do with the time thing and to do with the, um, it'll come back to me. It'll I certainly didn't expect us to be talking about the nature of time. <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite subjects, but you know, I, 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 you know, it's funny, I, I always assume that most conversations when I go online, most conversations move into the mind-body connection and stuff. And I was kind of expecting us to be chatting about that. But it's funny how, you know, time, <laughs> it just moves into whatever seems relevant at the time. Yeah, and but yeah. I, think, I think the time conversation is also really relevant also in relation to mind-body. Because if our mind... Um, sees time as linear, it affects our body when it comes to healing. Because if you see that, if your perception of time has to be that I have to, in order to heal, I have to do go through stages um, one to 10 to get from this stage to that stage, that is how your body will play it out. But if you 
your own mind is not so fixated on time being linear and you're like my healing is already there it's there i am mm. already healed i just have to bring it into my present you could heal a lot faster so yeah. that is the mind body connection definitely it's mm. how your mind perceives time how your mind perceives healing mm. how your mind sees yourself moving through time mm. it yeah. has so much impact mm. on you like i think in terms of like i say i'm following my calling and it feels really good you know that you're doing what you came here to do when you feel that you're following your calling but to me a calling is i know my future has already happened and so my calling is my future calling me to my mm. it's my future self that. calling me that's great like calling oh i've never heard it described quite like that before that's my future calling oh that's amazing that's my calling i love it yeah. i love it and that's I really it. what it feels like it feels mm. like oh it's already done that's that's where i'm going and it's calling me to kind of come over here yeah and, and you know there's there's lots of evidence that, that when people feel that they've got a calling or or something that gives their life meaning like every thought and belief and feeling we have has a physiological effect a neurological and physiological effect but there's lots of evidence that suggests when people feel they have a calling or a purpose, then they tend to be healthier. Yes. Uh, and, and, and I think what, in many ways what you find is that sense of peace or purpose is bringing about a, a different spectrum of, of biology. There's less stress, for example, but it's not just less stress. There's more, there's more of other healthy things going on in the body as well simply because of your your belief that this is something for me or that feeling that that comes from that belief in my my calling or my purpose and and every feeling has a physiological effect yeah exactly and this is very often when i'm speaking with people and the topic of illness and dealing with cancer and all comes up um, my response to people is that don't even think about healing cancer but think about living life Ask yourself mm -hmm. questions like, what is my purpose? What is my calling? What have I come here to do? do? Are there people in my life who love me? Are there people who I love? Have I suffered a trauma recently that I need to heal? Those are the mm. things to look at. Don't analyze the illness. Don't ask yourself, how did I get it? What's the illness? What's the purpose of the illness? What do I need to learn from it? In fact, don't do any of that. And that's in fact what a lot of healers do focus on is like mm. ask yourself what's the lesson in it what am i meant to learn no in fact disregard all that and go right through it to the other side as if you are healed your healed self is calling you but what is wow. that healed self doing right now what is the healed self's life look like right now so think of yourself as healed if you are healed mm. if you have that clean bill of health what are you doing with that healed life? And you see, and the idea is most of us have no idea what is our healed self doing. We think in terms of, I need to get well, I need to find the lesson in it so I can get rid of it, so I can go back to living the life I was living. But that was a life that gave you the illness in the first place. This mm. illness is telling you that that life is not your life. So you need to find your healed self and go towards that. Yeah, wow. I've never heard it described in quite such lucid terms. You know, you're, you're calling your healed self because that when you have that sense of meaning and purpose and direction, it puts what maybe is currently happening into a much larger perspective. And therefore, you're more likely to make the bet. You may be more likely to make better choices. Yes. Whatever, whatever those choices have to be. But yes. you you might find yourself making better choices because you're you're in an expanded state. You're more creative. You're more instead of being afraid by looking at what's happening, you're actually more expanded, looking to the future, and therefore you're more likely to make the decisions necessary to get you to that future. Exactly right. And wow. then you kind of start looking at the illnesses. Okay, this came in to make me see that. I wasn't following my purpose. Thank you, illness. Now let's get the show on the road. Come on, like, let's deal with this, whatever, like bring it on, whatever I have to do to deal with this because I need to go and do that. Wow, amazing. That's, it just amazing. shifts your whole being, wow. your perspective. It shifts your physio, yeah, it shifts you physically. Yeah, wow.
Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Cool. Oh, wow. This yeah. has been such an amazing conversation. I have loved really? it. Really? Yeah. yeah. It, it literally feels that we're just having a, a conversation. Because I'm in my kitchen. Those of you who are wondering what the, 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 what's on in the background there, I'm in, in my kitchen. And it feels like, you, like, Anita, you're in my kitchen. And we're just having a, a chat, a blether, as they say. The word for chat in Scotland is a blether. <laughs> Uh, so we're just having a blether over dinner, uh, you that, know, and I'm forgetting that we're Facebook living here and and doing whatever. But I guess Facebook Live is just a it can be a live conversation, and that's really what this has been is a live conversation. Yeah, it really has, and it does feel like we're in the same room, just just chatting. It really yeah. does, and I've got my false uh, faux wall, my fake wall behind me, <laughs> my rainbow wall. Yeah. I've got my kitchen that my dad and I fitted by ourselves. My dad and I put it all together. We, we, we just redid everything and just basically did it from scratch. Oh, yeah. wow. It's great fun. That's great yeah. to be able to do that. That's, yeah. Yeah, I'm it, not it, much of a handy person. Yeah, it, it was a steep learning curve for me. I had I had changed a light bulb in my life prior to that. <laughs> you sound but, like me. <laughs> yeah, but we re we renovated the whole house. Wow. You know, my dad and I and Elizabeth, my partner, and my mum helped a little bit as well. And we had lots of family kind of pitched in heat whenever it was necessary. But my dad and I did most of the building work, and then Elizabeth did most of the decorating work. Oh, cool. <laughs> wow. Is Danny panning the camera around then? Oh, right. Got you. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Yeah. This is great. And it's evening for you and noontime yeah. for me. It's uh, 10 past nine in the evening. Wow. Yeah. It's uh, 10 past one p.m. for me Pacific um, and you know tonight I am actually flying to India to see my mom wow that would be amazing yeah she's wow. 90 years old and oh, I'm man. heading over to see her so oh, amazing. I'm, ex I'm excited about that so mm. getting, getting on a flight tonight from LA all the way to Mumbai <laughs> Oh, wow. That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. I hope you have a great time. Your mum will be so pleased to see you. She misses me when I'm not there. Yeah. She really misses me a lot. Yeah, so, I, I mean, imagine. I miss her too, a lot, a lot. Um, but she, she counts the days till my visits. Yeah. Oh, so she's, that's so sweet. Yeah, she is. She's <laughs> lovely. Danny and I are both going to see her. So that should be nice. So, oh, nice. So, David, I... Um, Danny's giving me the signal that we should probably wrap up the video now. So oh, wow. I want to thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, oh, it was my pleasure. I've loved it. Oh, I've loved it too. And I love having conversations like this, you know, with guests because it really brings out different sides and different topics. And so I love mm -hmm. it. We must do this again sometime. Definitely. Yeah. Can't wait. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And, um, and if you, um, so, so for anyone who's tuned in, like if you have tuned in on my side, you can find David, give us your website. Uh, it's www. Uh, drdavidhamilton.com. Great. And check him yeah. out on Heal Documentary. Check out his book on I Heart. It's called I Heart Me or I Love Me. Yeah. Um, that was the book that Oscar, your dog, came into your life to help yeah. you write. To help me write. Exactly yeah. the two years that you were writing that book. Yeah. Amazing. It's actually, that book is currently on Amazon for $1.99 until wow. the end of September. So he now's the do time push. to pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow, now's on, the time. On, on, Kin on Kindle for one ninety nine. Yeah. That's perfect. Now's the time to, to get it. Um, and and so if those of you are on my page, you know where to find me. This video will be on YouTube, so check out my YouTube channel. Um, if you want more videos like that, I have them on my YouTube channel, which is um, anitamurjani.com slash YouTube. Um, and uh, great. And maybe if we're lucky, I can convince David to send us that little video clip oh, yeah, of his yeah, dog, yeah. which yeah. when you saw Oscar in the, we can and post can it on, on the, the thread. Page as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, if you upload it somewhere, we can post it on the thread. 
Will so, do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And and anyone else listening in, if you've got your own images, stories, anything on the topics we've shared, post them. We'd love to see them, especially images or stories of communication from your deceased loved ones. Because, you know, the more we talk about it, the more normal it becomes. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much, David. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I've so enjoyed this. I have as well. Mm. Oh, I have. And, um, mm. and thank you to everyone who's tuned in and listened in. And I will see you all. You know, I'm going to try and do a video live while I'm in India, but uh, I will see you all hopefully next week, if not sooner. Um, so bye, everyone. And Bye, everyone. It's been so much fun. Lots of love. It's been lots of fun. Yeah.